Okay, GDG. Hi everyone, how's it going? It's Dr. Rich Shevner here with another live stream as part of why you live and get writ live is like we like to call it. We're hanging out here. We are nearing the end of the term. We're doing all the things with writing projects, I'm sure. Hi Dia, how you doing? We are doing the many things. Um, I had a blast hanging out for recruitment day, uh, fall campus day on Saturday. Um, we also have a video up on now on our, our YouTube channel too. If you want to check that out, feel free to. And Dia is one of our guests that's on there. So yeah, uh, shout out to you and the many people who made that happen. Super exciting. So today, um, this is our second to last stream for the term. We are talking about writing with web platforms. How might you move your writing from print to web platforms? What are some ideas you might have for doing that? And secondly, how might you maintain a professional website for your work? Do you have one currently? If you take my classes, for example, you're probably working on it. If you take other classes in the writing department, you're probably ha you've probably developed some kind of website, but um, do you have one that's actually home for you? Right, that features all of your work and things like that. It's a thing that I think we can easily take for granted when we're writers to have our own sort of professional website to maintain it so that people can find us. They can find it through social media platforms for us. And it's a place we can put our work, we can brag about it. We can keep people updated on our process, things like that. So what do you have? That's something that I want to get, get to in this program. Um, we have a special guest, Dr. Lisa Ampleman, who will be speaking with us uh, later in the program, just not, not too long from now, probably about 10 minutes or so. Uh, so before then, I have a couple points to make for you all. As always, before we begin our main topic, I want to discuss a few items, as is now tradition, on the show. Once again, and many, many times over, as I'll say, throughout the stream this year, is I'd like to thank Ready Center Director John Suffren and the Ready Department for supporting another term of Get Rid Live. If you'd like to see any past streams, you can find them right here on our webpage. And we have links that are updated pretty regularly. Um, big shout out to May for doing that for us. Really appreciate you keeping that updated. And um, yeah, if you want to look at any of that stuff, it's on demand. So if you're joining us on the channel, on demand right now. You can find all those descriptions and links below. Check those things out. Uh, so last week we had a really great discussion about writing in the five senses and drinks. So what kind of writing imbues brewing processes? How do we write after we taste and activate our senses, our other senses as well? We talked about food two weeks before that. It was an awesome discussion with Dr. Ashley Beardsley. We talked about writing as podcasting. So lots to enjoy, and each stream is about an hour and a half. So if you just want to kick it on, rewatch it again, for example, while you're working on a project, might be useful, especially as you start to wrap up your term um, here at York or wherever you're, you are in the world and wherever you're working out deadlines. Okay, so we have that. Uh, again, thanks to the Writing Center and the Writing Department for supporting the program. Our YouTube page is also linked in the description below um, so you can see where all that stuff is. And we also post content pretty regularly. So for example, like this may sound off, but we have a new piece on uh, running campus days um, where essentially this is what happened on fall campus days. And it's about a two minute video um, just to get show you guys some personality and so forth um, from our department. So feel free to check that out as well. And uh, you can look forward to a couple more things coming out at the end of the term. For example, some students I'm working with are have recently authored uh, a couple of software reviews, and we're going to be posting that to um, on the YouTube page. Okay, and then uh, the Writing Center page too. We also have, you know, um, some more sort of links that are that are out here. In addition to this um, stream which is designed to be helpful, um, featuring interviews and sort of workshopping materials. We also have links to our one-on-one -on -one appointments, our accessibility specialist links, and our drop-in sessions. So whether you are 
thinking about the um, assignment itself and trying to decode what is required of you in terms of writing, you can check out, you can do that with a one-on-one -on -one appointment. Also, if you're looking to do some line editing in the final touches, have a nice read through, another set of eyes perhaps um, on an essay, sign up for a one-on-one -on -one appointment. It's free, totally free. And um, we are happy to do that as a department to support you. All right, so today's topic, writing for web platforms. Now, last year, we talked about something similar, which was moving your writing from print to the web. So particularly today with the live stream and so forth, we're gonna focus on professional websites and sort of platforms that writers tend to use. And that's why I wanted to bring on a special guest from the Cincinnati Review to speak to that. Um, but before that, a couple things I wanna mention is there are so many free tools out there, folks, that you can use in order to get your website up and running. If you're on YouTube enough, you'll probably some see something along the lines of sign up for Wix or sign up for some other Squarespace, for example, which allows you to publish websites at no cost. Now, there are limitations, right? If you go through WordPress, if you go through these drag and drop platforms, the limitation is that you are at the will of the design choices that these platforms have made. So sometimes when you're working with these platforms, it's difficult to move boxes around, to change the background, to embed video, things like that. But at the same time, they're really great for getting started. And a number of people, including myself, use this. Uh, for example, my website for the class that I'm teaching right now, um, for one of them, it is entirely through WordPress. So you can see at the top, it says there's like, it's not a paid plan, so I can remove the banner if I wanna pay for that. Very easy for me to copy paste in, you know, my entire Word doc into one singular page. And I'll just show you behind the scenes what's that, what that looks like. So I don't have to do any coding for this at all. I just have to update my pages and posts. And so, it's easy to get up and running. Um, if you look at this, like I, I think I can't, I can do coding in this if I want to, but it's pretty limited. And these kind of platforms um, have what are called WYSIWYGs, which means what you see is what you get. And so you're editing right on the page and then you're gonna preview that, right? So this might be kind of standard fare to some of you. Um, especially if you've been in our writing department classes. We work with Google Sites. Sometimes we work with WordPress. Since in my classes use Wix, for example, many, many other platforms. Don't wanna discount their value. <laughs> we like to get these little spams here, don't we? Let me see what I can do to, uh, to hide this out while we, while we work on that for a minute. I don't know why they like to uh, spam us here on the channel. It's like they, uh, it's like they don't, um, like they find us. I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. But anyways, we're gonna hide that for just a minute um, while I can resolve all those good things. And let's see if we can find the participants. Can I actually take that person out? Let's see, probably if I open it up in a browser and then I move it over here. Yes, I think I can do that. You have been put into a timeout. Oh, I timed out DF somehow. Sorry about that. I promise I didn't, I'm not uh, intending to time you out. Just this, uh, just these kind of posts. Getting the spams. All right. What was I saying? I was talking about platforms. Yes, I was. And, and uh, things like that. So what you see is what you get. You're gonna post these into, right onto the page. Very easy. In fact, uh, Dr. Lisa, who we'll be speaking with in a little bit, uses WordPress herself. So that's one option you have. 
the others that you may want to consider. Google Sites. My first year class is built entirely from Google Sites and I haven't had to do any code at all for this. It's mainly just hyperlinking and adding your text as you go. Very, very easy. Um, you could add text boxes. The one limitation I would say is that, at least I haven't found out how to do this um, effectively just yet, is putting in um, files that aren't from Google Drive and images and things like that. So that's one limitation. So you can check more out th about that in a minute. Um, real quick, I also wanna mention that Brackets is an entirely, totally free um, web editing platform. Very good. If you want to do things by hand, you can do that as well. And I'm going to come back to that at the, at the end of the program. We'll talk about Snack Edit too, and then my website, which has been built entirely from the ground up with Brackets and partially with Stack Edit. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and shut off this cam and move over to our discussion with Dr. Lisa Ampleman. Uh, in just a minute. So sit tight for just one second, folks. Okay. Okay, Lisa, how you doing? I think you're muted. <laughs> I'm great. I um, I'm realizing I didn't set up my less fancy microphone, but can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you just fine. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> All right, everybody. Um, I I don't know why I always say Ampleman, but it's Ampleman, right? Nah, it depends whether you're French Canadian or German. I guess. Are you French Canadian? Um. No, but the name is. Um, it is. Okay. It is. Yeah, it came down from the Quebec area. There's a Ampelman Pyrotechnics in French okay. Canada. Okay. Okay. And um, yeah, and in Germany, the little walk light man, mm. it's called an Ampelman. And there's like okay. stores dedicated to the the older ones pre um, pre falling of the wall. So wow, interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. The more, you know, there's so many connections mm -hmm. like Cincinnati, you know, German's histories and, um, French Canadian. Yeah. C'est bon for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, welcome to the program. Um, Lisa, so good to see you again in the virtual form. Cause it's been a few years since we've mm -hmm. actually seen each other. I think since I yeah. left university of Cincinnati in 2019. Um, but I want to say a couple words about you, if that's okay. And then the mm -hmm. Cincinnati review, and then we'll get into some questions if that, that works for you. Okay. Sounds perfect. great. And happy early Thanksgiving as well. I appreciate you being here. On the Thank video. you. Thank you. You know, what is it on um, Wednesday? It's like the biggest bar night of the year in right now in the States or something like yeah, that. Yeah, probably. Like, yeah. Probably. A lot of baking <laughs> happens today too, I think. But yeah, probably a, a lot of other things yeah. in prep as well. <laughs> okay. Um, excellent. All right. So couple words about Dr. Um, Ampleman, I want to say here on the program, and this is from um, her bio as well, which is also fantastic. A native Midwesterner, Lisa Ampleman, 
she, her, is the author of two books of poetry, romances from Louisiana State Press, right? Is that it? Okay. Mm -hmm. And Full Cry from which press is that? National right? Federation of State Poetry Societies. Awesome. Okay. And a chat book. I've been collecting this to tell you from Kent State University. I graduated the PhD program in English and Comparative Literature from at University of Cincinnati. Woo woo, right? Um, I miss that woo -woo. program a lot. <laughs> Go Bearcats. Yes. She served as assistant and associate editor of the Cincinnati Review from 2011 to 2013. Her poems have appeared in journals such as Poetry, Image, Kenyon Review Online, 32 Poems, Vinyl, Poetry Daily, and Verse Daily, and her reviews and prose in America, Diagram, Good Letters, Image, Pilates, yeah, Pilates, sorry, um, mm -hmm. and Southeast, Southeast Review Online. And what's interesting is I met Lisa at the Association of Writers and Writing Programs, I think, when mm -hmm. she was with working with the Cincinnati Review and I was like, this seems like a really interesting school. And so does the Cincinnati Review. So we met, I think, for lunch. And I remember I just, we yeah. talked a bit about what it was like to be in a program and things of that sort. And a couple of years later, I found myself in the program. So I was really grateful for those insights. Um, yeah. And never actually, I don't think I, I volunteered with the Cincinnati Review, but I would hang out in the office every once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> That's allowed. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. Um, I think some people were doing exams and things like that. Uh, they were celebrating, like finishing their comps or doing something like that. And um, yeah, it was always nice to stop by. A lot of good energy there. So. Good. And uh, just a couple words about the Cincinnati Review. Um, it's published many promising new and emerging voices. Yes, is that the latest issue? It is, yeah. It's just out um, this month. Um yeah, it, for people who don't know Lit Mags, like it's, it looks like a paperback book. It's basically produced the same fashion, but go ahead, keep going. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, poetry and prose, they've been selected across different anthologies, such as Best American Essays, Best American Fantasy, Best American Short Stories, Best Microfiction. So many nominations coming in for the O. Henry Prize Stories, the Orison Anthology, and the Pushcart Prize Anthology. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, for what is essentially a small office, right, at the corner of the building, you all do so many amazing things. Um, and that's why I wanted to bring you on, because I'm just continually impressed by the work you do online and the publications you release. So, again, awesome. welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so let's get to a couple questions here. Um, you are the managing editor mm -hmm. for the Cincinnati Review. And... What does that involve just day to day? Uh, what does a managing editor do for a literary journal like the Cincinnati Review? I do a little bit of everything. Um, the overall arching thing I sometimes say is I keep the trains on time. Mm -hmm. um, so I have an eye on deadlines and I oversee um, three graduate students. Um, and during the school year, they have mm -hmm. a, um, uh, graduate assistantship with us in lieu of teaching. Mm -hmm. So I oversee them. I make sure the genre editors who are professionals in the field know their deadlines and get the help they need. Um, I communicate with printers uh, and other external vendors uh, with our designer. Um, and I do copy editing and proofreading. Mm -hmm. So on any given day, I'm doing a couple different things, which I really like. Every now and then there's a day where I'm like, I really don't have anything else to do. I'm just going to read submissions all day, mm -hmm. which is something else that I do. I help pass them along to the people who make decisions. Um, but yeah, and you know, I'm on email, I'm reading submissions, I'm sending out edits to a writer. Um, I'm communicating back and forth, liaisoning with our university offices and our vendors. And um, yeah, a lot of things like that. So um, it's, it's never boring. Absolutely. I will say that. Now, I didn't even mean, I, I didn't put this to you before we were, um, starting the interview, um, as in terms of a question, but like, I mean, a lot of that you're, you are in the office, you're sort of mentoring these students, you're keeping the day to day things like, um, what did you have to do to adapt? Like when everybody was kind of sent home for a while due to the pandemic? Yeah. I mean, that first semester was rougher. We started using Teams and we figured out the VPN for the university. And um, I was able to access files, but I didn't figure out right away 
how to help the students do that. So they could access their computers remotely um, eventually. And I was able to give them access to our all our shared files that way. So yeah, we, um, you know, it was rough, like it was for everyone. That issue was a little bit late, but, um, you know, we kept working and um, we still work remotely. Um, much of the university has gotten back to in-person. Most of the classes are either in-person or uh, mm -hmm. hybrid. Um, I think the staff tend to cycle in a couple of days a week, um, which is basically what Matt O'Keefe, my other permanent um, colleague and I do at this point. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thanks to the wonder of Teams and Zoom and University VPN, um, we've been able to make the transition and it's even made some things better. Mm -hmm. um, we do copy editing, what we call campfires, where I copy edit a piece that the editors have looked at and I do the final edit with them, talking them through what I'm thinking, asking them questions. And we used to do that in print, like, you know, having the pages spread out on a, a little um, pedestal and kind of talking through things. And now I can like uh, make changes and we can see how it looks and I can undo that change to go back to the original. Um, and uh, the editors really like this new virtual way of doing it quite a bit. So, um, yeah, so that's been an improvement and yeah. you know, there's less of a commute. Um, <laughs> sure. Right. So. so you've got to embrace those hybrid forms. It's just something that, um, the research I've been doing with, uh, game creators and developers have suggested is like the optimal way to go now. Um, Oh yeah. And yeah. I've written for a journal that's, or worked for a journal that's entirely online, just all through Slack and, Sometimes I wish mm -hmm. I had that more like embodied work with them and, and things yeah. like that, but just a little bit, you know, and yeah. it's usually once a year at a conference, but we're just like celebrating each everything. So yeah, I'm glad that worked totally. out for you. That's great. Yeah. And tell Matt I said yeah. hello. I haven't talked to him in a bit either. That's... I will. I will. <laughs> um, okay. So today we're talking about writing for web platforms and... As I mentioned earlier, like I'm just continually impressed with the Cincinnati Reviews, like web presence. I mean, I follow you on Instagram and I see your posts there and then just generally have this page bookmarked and I'm seeing new posts and things of that sort beyond just what you do with these um, impressive print collections that you, issues that you put out. Um, so you have stories on there, you have blogs and even videos I've seen from YouTube. But I want to ask you, like, how important is it for the Cincinnati Review to maintain a constant presence online? It's vital. I mean, um, we did a survey this summer because we're approaching our 20th anniversary. Mm. And we uh, emailed out to our entire mailing list and invited them to participate. <clears throat> and one of the questions was, do you read mostly in print, mostly mm -hmm. online or in between? And we had a couple different questions for that in between. And um, it, as you imagine, uh, some print and some online was the, the most popular, mm -hmm. but stepping down from that, it was a little bit more toward online than on print. And I think some of that probably is related to the generational shifts that have happened and are happening. Mm. Um, but I think that a lot of, especially up and coming writers experience um, the literary community through their phone, their tablet, their computer, through the internet. And in order to find those writers and readers, uh, we definitely have to have an active presence mm -hmm. um, and keep up with what's happening. Um, and, you know, one element of it is subscriptions. Um, we're a nonprofit organization. We're sponsored by the English department. We don't have to turn a profit. But ideally, we'd like to have as many subscriptions as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's, you know, one of the end goals, but, um, in general, just having a community of writers and readers who are interacting and, and, uh, taking in the content, um, that's really what we want. We want our writers pieces to be read mm -hmm. and the readers are increasingly online. So that's definitely a huge part of the equation. Yeah. They seem to, uh, have this kind of symbiotic relationship. They're going to find more about your journal just something that's circulated online it, it seems like yeah yeah, yeah. Wow, wow 
Um, okay, so you kind of mentioned just when we were sort of doing that, uh, talking about that question on hybrid forms of working with teams and so forth, and love that idea of the campfire working mm -hmm. together and making that even digital. Um, can you talk us through the editorial process of, or even like the, I guess the workflow of this entire review, like how the team prepares submissions and content, um, especially for the web? Yeah. So why don't I talk, well, I know we're going to talk about it uh, as time goes on, but why don't I talk about the micro series, which is the creative content that we have online uh, primarily, although we do have um, samples from the issues. So um, for example, that one by Vincent Frontero that's at the top right now, mm -hmm. um, one of our student editors accepted that for the micro series. We sent Vincent a note, we sent him a contract with all the information, so he sent us back a picture and a photo and then we um then the student editors have a folder uh with files where they can make their own suggestions and then i do a copy edit of the piece whether it's for print or for mm -hmm. online and you know it's for house style it's not necessarily oh we don't like this it's you know is this following the chicago manual of style if it's breaking from that is it purposeful for the piece and um then uh i send any prospective edits out to the author at that point for their review mm, okay. and so um for the sign at bogoval um we didn't actually have any edits in the poem itself but if you go to the epigraph just above the poem mm -hmm. um originally uh a little bit more just under the picture. Okay. Um, Fair. After, after the, the Langston Hughes? Yes, yeah. Okay. So we're looking at the Langston Hughes. Um, the Langston Hughes was lineated differently in uh, the file that Vincent Frontero sent us. And so we went and looked mm -hmm. at the original and just made sure it lined up. Um, we double checked the uh, spelling of Bogoval, which in this particular painting is the way it's set up mm -hmm. um and then the content itself it our house dictionary didn't have any differences and things like that so um and then whether it's print or online then it gets set uh we have a typesetter who does the print mm. for uh online we have wordpress so there's a file that i've created with all the changes that the student editor can just grab and put up online and um then we always have someone read after and proofread um, to proofread their introduction. I also always look at the bio and make sure we have links if possible that, you know, New Jersey is spelled out, which is our, our style slash Chicago style mm -hmm. and things like that. So acceptance, copy editing, uh, checking in with the author, proofreading, and then publishing. That's uh, kind of the broad sweep mm -hmm. of what happens. Wow. Um you know, I, I have to go through, like, I would have to go through all of them just to uh, to confirm, but I want to ask you, I mean, you have it, what I can see here on my screen of showing people is this audio file of the reading. Is that a common staple? Is that something you ask them to do, or is it optional? It's definitely optional. We invite them to do it. I would say 90% of writers want to and are able to. Yeah. Um, we don't have it as a requirement because we know that um, the technology or the time is not available to all mm. of our writers. Um, but, uh, and I think once we even had a, um, a video instead, uh, but only only one person's opted for that at this point. Um, and because again of the, the changes in technology, you know, everyone can like make a voice recording on their phone and email it and it's M4A and I just, you know, our website prefers MP3, so I just convert it and we can pop it in really easily with WordPress, um, which is, I, I think I mentioned is our, our platform. Um, and there's a couple advantages to that. So you can hear the emphasis that the writer puts um, on how the lines fall and the sentences fall. Um, you can um, also hear it if you're someone who is um, uh, has uh, uh, seeing challenges. Mm -hmm. So we've had people really thank us for that in the past. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, the more multimedia that we can include on the web, 
the more relevant we are to how people are consuming content these mm. days. Fascinating. We have a question. Um, I've had to mute the chat because I have a few bots here on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Those yeah. are, uh, yeah. You know, I, I, I feel like you could make an entire like poem just out of bots. I'm sure that's been done. You have to, you'll have to let me know. That's mm -hmm. Um, uh, Dia is asking, can we submit multimodal pieces that fall under the genres you publish? For example, if we submitted pieces created as a website, is that something that you've encountered before with people? Who yeah. Um, it, it's something we're definitely interested in. Uh, we've yeah. done visual pieces. Um, I, I've interacted with a contributor about possibly doing something like that, where you scroll down and things appear. Mm. Um, and I know that there's a way to do that within our platform, but we are working on something exactly like that for a play by the same playwright who's in this fall issue. Okay. We're a little bit behind where we wanted to be, but we've contracted with uh, a designer to um, kind of set the play as a web page. Um, and so, you know, it has text or text messages slash SMS slash WhatsApp things that would pop up. Hmm. There's audio recordings that we um, are probably going to do. And um, yeah, I think we're definitely open to that. Um, in order to embed it, it would, there are particular things that would be a little bit more challenging, but we can always link and screenshot. And, um, you know, I don't always know the technical things to make things work, but often uh, I can work with people and do some searches and try to figure something out. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. I like welcoming in those kind of, um let's just say like alternative approaches to yeah whether it's storytelling um in the form of a play or it's it's poems or fiction things like that so cool and then yeah that's uh, we didn't mention also just acre books being kind of um you're uh in charge of that as well right or part of managing part of that as well yeah i'm the poetry series editor so okay. i do poetry acquisitions mm -hmm. and um the editor nicola mason um definitely keeps me updated on what's going on but right she okay. is yeah. She is the head honcho and working hard at it. Yeah. Oh, wow. I have not talked to her forever. That was, I think I interviewed her once for a piece in um, Soapbox Media. Yeah. When she yeah. was still with since I would be, and then made the transition. So yeah, I'm walking as we go. Mm -hmm. That's what live streams mm -hmm. are. You just, you know, you talk aloud. As you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So we were talking about the micro series. Yes. Um, and it's, web exclusive works as far as I, I understand. Can you walk me mm -hmm. through like when that kind of started and um, you know, what was the, what was the kind of impetus for doing um, I guess series like that? So I started as managing editor in 2017. Mm -hmm. So I was a student editor up until 2013, graduated, did a couple of different things. And then when Nicola moved up to acre books, I had the chance to interview and um, take this job, which I am thrilled about to be able to do literary publishing in Cincinnati. Um, anyway, backing up, uh, at that point, the website was not WordPress based. We had a WordPress based blog, mm -hmm. but, um, the other elements of the website, like the issues page, um, and you know, things like that were, uh, XML based. Um, mm -hmm. and they were also created uh originally in flash which was starting to be um kind of uh decommissioned at that point <clears throat> so on some browsers you could see our submission manager you could see our blog but you couldn't see the main page or the issues pages mm -hmm. and um we contracted with right around the, when i was starting this was already developing so i don't want to pretend like i was the one who did it but <laughs> um as part of the early months of my uh tenure we worked with a contractor to redesign the website to be what it is you see today. And I can talk a little bit more about what I think about that um, and where we are now. But at that point, it was all WordPress. Mm -hmm. And um, we figured out that um, there another thing that we wanted to do was include the student editors and content decisions more directly, which we've even increased since then uh, re relating to the print magazine. Mm -hmm. But the idea was from one of our editors, I don't, you know, I went with it, but I'm going to credit Gwen Kirby, who is an excellent writer mm -hmm. and person uh, with it. Um, she's like, why can't we have a flash series online? 
I think that's ideal. Um, I think everyone's different, but when I read on the web, I can't do very much at one point. Um, and so shorter things seem like the ideal um, way to go about it. And it's, you know, it's inter, it's, it's several kinds of genres. The right. students get to read cross genre. They all pick pieces, like the students themselves are writers in the doctoral program in creative writing. So, you know, they come in as poets or fiction writers, but they all end up choosing things from other genres as well. Um, which I think is um, a great thing as you think about what uh, they'll end up doing, whether it's teaching or editing down the line. Mm. Um, so a couple different motivations. Um, I, 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 at that point, I saw that there were really cool online, fully online magazines. Um, and we had writers who wanted to share content more widely with friends and family. And, you know, I also saw right around then Maggie Smith's poem good bones went viral i was like it was from waxwing uh an online magazine mm -hmm. i would love for uh our writers for that to happen for one of them so um yeah just thinking about the the modes of of transmission and um where we were and where we wanted to go wow bringing back so many memories um gwen and i finished about the same time and yeah that's that's great that she uh, envisioned that and that students get more even more sort of experience thinking about um web exclusive content and yeah like mm -hmm. how now these these pieces can just take off right um mm -hmm. and it might be 10 lines or something like that or something more um yeah, the good robust. bones poem. It, yeah, the good bones poem is not very long. Right, yeah. it's a little bit longer than a sonnet, but not you know, it's not a hugely long one, which right. I think is also good for people who are new to poetry. Yeah, and we can see. I'm looking at the one in the Poetry Foundation now, and just how that's been like it's reprinted, republished. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing. Well, um, yeah, thanks for that overview on the micro series. Uh, interesting just to hear how like that how it, you know it was sort of envisioned um uh, in recent years and it seemed to be you know get a lot of it's it's updating regularly so it's, it's a nice like treat mm -hmm. for me when i'm looking for something to um tie me over between issues and, and things of that sort yeah. um so one other thing i i wanted to ask you about is and this was one of the actually the main reason i i reached out to you all because i came across uh Connor Yuck's blog post on mm -hmm. the whys and whens of having a writer's website. And that was very timely for me because I teach a class called Digital Authoring Practicum where students are working on their websites and we think a lot about these issues like purposes and when to publish it. And it's it's hard to pick a platform to work with and mm -hmm. to just think about like, how often am I gonna update it? Is it just a static page? Things of that sort. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to read one passage from it that I had here and yeah. saved, which is that the choice to create and manage website as an author often comes down to forging stronger connections with the writing community. And this is what Connor says in the post. Um, so I want to look at your website. Thinking sure. about that. Cause you Let's do it. talk about linking to that here on this page. And I, this is also folks linked in the description. If you want to check out, um, that blog post, because lots of good, like there's a, essentially a panel of voices um about sort of layout design things of that sort and again gets at the wise lens um so you can read about that but i'd love to learn from you and i'm going to pull up your site here in just a second is uh you know how often you update it like why do you maintain your website and things like that i know you mentioned some of these things in the, the article but yeah, yeah i just want to put that to you the hows and whys i guess and <clears throat> for your own site well, let me do a historical survey for myself of how it all yeah. fell into place. <laughs> okay. So um, I'd seen that my peers were starting to put websites together around the time my first full length book was published. Mm -hmm. So around 2012, 2013, it's just a couple years after online submissions um, kind of took off. And, um, you know, social media platforms, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, I was like, I, I want to have a website. I um, I knew WordPress from working with Cincinnati Review. And I think there are other even, uh, like I've heard really good things about Squarespace and Wix. 
Um, but that's just what I went with just because it's what I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, um, the, so at that point also to think about, um, kind of time and genre blogs were a really big thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're not as much anymore. I think there are people who maintain blogs, um, and that sort of thing. But, um, when I signed up, it was like, okay, you're signing up for a blog and you're going to have other pages. And in the beginning, uh, for the first two years, I actually kept up with the blog mm -hmm. and I would post, you know, if I had a piece come out in a, a journal or, or something like that. Um, and then over time I stopped updating it because I had a baby mm -hmm. and it's, I just didn't have as much to say for a while. And then I was like, oh, it's just been too long. Um, but I haven't figured out how to um, sunlight the blog feature because it was so inherent to what to the package I purchased originally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so now I see it almost as a static site that I would update when I had new uh, publications. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, see that the last entry was from October 9th, 2014. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's been a little while. Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. Um, and now it's, I feel like what I do, if I read someone's, uh, a poem by someone I, I like, or I read a poem I like by someone in a magazine, I don't know that person well, I'll go to their website and see if they have other things available online, or I can learn about their books or who they are. And so my bio right now is the front page. Um, I, I was at least able to set that up. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Um, the poems and prose, that's the one I want to let's take a look at that too. So I have some things I want to critique about myself. If you click on books, okay. I want to do a drop down menu on books. Oh, sorry. I just told you to do the other thing. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Okay, I changed I, my mind. I have books. I have books up here. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd rather do a drop down menu. If you scroll down, you can see the three books I have in print at this point. I've got one more forthcoming in 2024. Um, but a drop down menu with each on its own page seems more simple and clean, which I think is where the web has gone these days. Mm -hmm. Um, and so at, at this point, um, I think that it's good to have all the information available. I link to the press. People can buy the book straight from there for the most part. Um, and, uh, you know, if someone's interested in what I'm doing, they can also contact me. There's a direct contact form. I used to include my email address until the contact form um, function started being more um, easy to use. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I have had people use that to be like, hey, I'm going to be in Cincinnati doing a reading. Would you like to join the reading or um, to otherwise solicit poems from me or ask me questions? OK. Now nice. going back to poems and prose online. Okay. This is Go. the key reason why I think people, in addition to like wanting to sell their books, why people have personal websites to link to pieces that are available online. Mm -hmm. And some of them list the stuff that's in print as well. But, um, you know, I actually spent a lot of time yesterday preparing for this conversation and looking at how people presented the poems and prose online. Mm -hmm. And some people, most people like me just have like a list and it's, um, you know, organized in a couple of different ways. Mine is poems first and then, um, prose. Some people have separate sections for media, which for me is at the bottom. I'd love to separate that out. I just have a, sh like a long list. Um, I've seen some people do two columns so you can see it all at once. Um, or they do select pieces instead of everything possible available mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and some organize it by book um, a friend of mine uh, has you know um, you know poems from this book poems from that book poems from a work in progress mm -hmm. so there's lots of ways to organize it and I think over the winter break I want to uh, give my um, site a little bit of a uh, update for that reason mm -hmm. so and I also admire people who are using visual elements. So this is jumping a little bit ahead. 
um, to, uh, but there's a poet, there's a writer I, um, I spent a lot of time looking and I know I've seen people use images instead of just link, 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 link. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so I could show you an example of that if you like something I aspire to and would like to do. Sure. Someone yeah. Else and no, no problem to jump around. That's why we're, okay. that's why we're here. No, it's, it's okay. the illusion. People think we we're just doing it all naturally. We've, we've like, right. we've talked about ahead of time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but can you, yeah, if you have the link, you can put it in the, uh, uh, zoom chat and I'll, I'll be happy sure. to pull it up. Yeah. Um, so this is a writer who I've interacted with in a couple ways. Uh, Sonia Livingston. Okay. Um, she's a nonfiction writer. Uh, who I admire a lot. Um, we published her in the Cincinnati Review. She was a guest editor one semester when our nonfiction editor uh, was on leave. And um, she's someone I, I, whose work I love to read mm -hmm. uh, in general. So um, I admire her as a person and a writer. And her website, um, I see a lot now that are kind of like one page based. Like you can see the headings and as you scroll down, everything's kind of on one page and you can kind of jump to it if you use the items from that menu. Um, but what Sonia also does is she kind of has highlights that are image based. Um, and um, I'm not sure uh, if you're, yeah. So you can see kind of how that uh, falls into place. So she's got her most recent book there. Um, she's got her bio and then um, the writing samples section um, is especially where she, um, so the books are visual, mm -hmm. um, everything's all on one page. And then the writing samples, look at that. Mm -hmm. That's so much more interesting than line, 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 line. And right. I, I really want to um, look into how I can make that happen. I'm sure there's a way to do it. I have ideas about how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, at the very least, I could use Canva to make an image and turn that image into a link. So, mm. um, yeah, wow, so that's, yeah. that's what I aspire to, um, is incorporating, you know, people also have been, uh, linking image and text a lot, like obviously Instagram, um, mm -hmm. but there's more poets who are doing erasures or visual poetry. Oh. And I think that in some ways is connected to, you know, the way we're consuming things, we're consuming, mm -hmm. um, images and content or text content together. Yeah. I, um, I was just say like, when I, I'm, I, there might be a slight delay on the, on the YouTube end, but, um, yeah. what I'm looking at now is Sonia's, uh, bio. And if you scroll, I think I can tell if it does this, but it may just be like a, what's sometimes called a scroll spy effect where mm -hmm. it looks like it kind of darkens and lightens as you go, which is a neat little, little effect. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just, I'll mention my website. I had really had to think like kind of carefully about that when I was working on mine um, because I just have it all on one page. And as you scroll, it just gives you like the CV teaching samples and highlights. But, you know, this is different than a, a CV, right? Like it, it mm -hmm. can be sort of vertical line by line and uh, like visually it may not be the most interesting. Um, and I think on the page that I have here, I've, I need to update this. So I, I'll be doing work as well in the winter break. <laughs> we can, we mm -hmm. can like message each other and say, we're updating our websites. Um, yeah. It's Hold just each other a, accountable. Right. Yeah. It just, it's, so it's a block blocks of recent highlights, you know, and this was hard to put together because I had to crop pages and sort of make them look, um, I don't know, uniform across things. I had mm -hmm. things that were missizing. What I like mm -hmm. is that it kind of it's responsive, and a lot of websites now, even WordPress ones, I think do that pretty, pretty well. Let's see if oh yeah, um, there is yeah, that's exactly what yeah, exactly to like use images to kind of connect to what you're doing. I love that. Um, let's see what's I I just had her name in. Oh, let's go to the history. Do do do. Where are we at? Oh no. Um, Oh yeah, there it is. Okay, never mind. I just wanted to see if it's responsive. Sometimes, I mean, it really doesn't matter if if it is, but it's usually some of these platforms will adapt like mobily. Um, yeah, ours does, um, which is great. Yeah, just because you want to be able. Yeah, as we can see here, like the micro series does just that. 
and that's just even better for getting people to sometimes to look at um, look at pages if they're just sitting on their phone. I mean, I do most of my reading it seems like a lot, or just quick reading like on my phone now, and so yeah, you can yeah, check that out. It's nice. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, okay, so we talked about a poet um, whose whose websites you admire. Um, Want to kick it back just to the, the kind of the student angle. Um, I know a lot of us who watch the series are thinking about those websites, but I guess just to kind of sum up some of these, this conversation we've been having about your site and what we saw with um, Livingston's site, like what advice do you have for, you know, students, whether it's grad students or undergraduates to create and maintain a professional website, just maybe even on the maintenance side advice you might have. Um, I go back to that old adage, keep it simple, stupid. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why the stupid's on there, but just keep it simple. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that's one thing that our website currently does, the CR website does not do. Um, if you go to the homepage, mm -hmm. it, like we've got the menu on, on the right, which I like having because you can find other things in the same category. Um, but there's a lot happening compared to what uh, web, um, web venues are doing these days. I think simplicity has become a big part of it. Mm -hmm. So when you're setting up something, think of it as a discrete thing. Um, uh, if you have a part that you're going to need to update, you know, have a way to remind yourself to do that. Um, like a calendar item. I, mm -hmm. I've started doing things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what else? Um, keep in mind how you, I mean, it's about genre and audience. Think about how you mm -hmm. consume content and what would, how would you like to do it? So mm -hmm. I love having a visual element. Um, to be honest, I am really bad about clicking on videos. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm like, ah, I'll, I'll look at that later. But I think a lot of other people, especially those of the TikTok generation, consume things through videos. So um, do you have a way to, you know, it, for other platforms and content that you're putting up, can you have it automatically populate a part of your site um, mm. so that you know it's automatically updating even? I think probably some websites have the ability to make that happen cross-platform. Mm. Um, yeah, I think those are the main things. So think about what you enjoy, keep it simple, give yourself reminders for updates. And, um, oh, get feedback, which I always do for any kind of writing. Mm -hmm. um, and you know it's what we do at the cr um i was out sick and i said hey you know i'm out sick just have one of your peers proofread your posts before you put them up oh. and um i feel like that that is that is an evergreen sort of thing um you know once you update your site have a friend or peer go take a look and yeah. give you some feedback i um i don't think i asked this earlier but for the blog posts that you have, such as the one we were referencing with um, uh, by Connor Yak. Do you have a schedule of blog posts um, and how often, what does that look like? Because I find that that is something I think we were talking about your blog too. Like I just never did that for my own work. And so I just stopped blogging altogether. Yeah. It's not even on my website, but for yeah. the CR, how does that work? So they're on a rotation. Um, and we have it so that it lines up with other tasks. So no one's doing two things on the same week. Mm. So um, micro is up every Wednesday, except for like holidays or breaks. Like this week, we're not doing one. And then same thing for blog posts. So there's three of them and they, you know, it's like I can see Connor did one. And then right before that was Haley. And right before that was Taylor. Mm -hmm. um, and every now and then I'll have something from a contributor that I slip in as well. We usually try to run them on Tuesday or Thursday because um, those seem like better days than Mondays or Fridays for the way people interact with content. Um, but not always. Sometimes we'll have something on a Monday or a Friday. Mm -hmm. And we always post about it on our um, social media. And we have a monthly newsletter. Okay. And that has been a, a surprisingly huge way to get um, additional eyes on things. Mm. Um, when we did our survey, the vast majority of people said, I get my news from your newsletter. Um, some of the algorithms on social media are not our friends. Twitter may or may not be imploding. And so um, 
the, the monthly newsletter is a really big thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't tell them what to do. Like if they ha are asking, like, I'm trying to decide between this and this, I say, but you know, they, they're really smart and they write about things that they're interested in. Mm -hmm. And that ends up really resonating with other people. Mm -hmm. So they usually do one about once a month. Sometimes they'll have one twice a month if things fall in a particular way. So, you know, I, I feel like I know a friend who does her sub stack that way. You know, she just does one once a month. Um, and, you know, depending on your audience and what you're trying to do, that might be enough. If, you know, if you're a food blogger and you want new content all the time, you know, obviously you're going to do things twice a week or et cetera. But, um, yeah, I think it, it depends on audience. Yeah. Um, I have something rolling around in my head a question and it's not quite the open one just yet. Uh, maybe yeah. I can get there, but it's about, you have them blog things that they're interested in. Um, but I realized like your blog posts, your blogs that you have here are essentially like a way of getting your, uh, the audiences, the public audiences to know who the editors are. And that's something mm -hmm. like just in my own research work, I've been trying to sort of emphasize is like, we have to be more transparent about what we do as editors because we are human and you know and, we, um, and it's not just so it doesn't feel so much like gatekeeping when you can go out and do public work like this oh yeah um, yeah yeah I, again not a, not so much a question but just a comment like i think that it seems really um, crucial now more than ever to just open the door a little bit and welcome people in mm -hmm. in, in different ways yeah their name is always on the top of it it's not like the editors for the most part. Um, and, you know, some of them get really um, vulnerable as part of it. Mm -hmm. um, Taylor Bias, who uh, has built kind of herself as a literary brand, she has a huge following on Twitter. She's a great person mm -hmm. and supports other writers quite a bit. Um, but she wrote one about um, being stuck and ne needing to be able to write again. Um, and, um, Gosh, I'm not, I'm not sure if I do a quick search, I might be able to give you a keyword um, yeah. to, to use to find it. Um, I think it was a writing life one. So I'm going to use I'm going to use our handy category uh, organizer in our menu. Yes. Um, and see if we have writing life and writing landscape, which are two different things. Yeah. Excavating my voice after PhD exams. Ooh, um, I could relate to that one. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of people probably can, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, we haven't, we need to create a feed at the bottom of each of theirs for um, being able to find their work. Uh, one of our um, one of our editors a couple of years ago started that and I don't think we continued it. I'm gonna make a note actually. Hmm. Because that's what other sites do. Like you can find the author and then find everything that they've done on that particular site. So. Kind of keyword search their, use their name as the keyword search. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. So kind of opened up what it was like to work through the exam process. And we see some stories here about like dissertation year, sort of, you know, pandemic illnesses and things like that. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. A, a vulnerable position, but still like, I think it's, it, to me that I, I find I appreciate when writers do that. I'm like, we're not alone in mm -hmm. these struggles, but also like insights and epiphanies, you know, like yeah. making that more clear. Um, and it seems like, I don't know when, at least with Kairos, the journal I've been editing with, like when we've been a bit more public, people are more, seem to be more likely to reach out to us and say like, I want to talk to you about an issue or a journal. Like it's not, it's not sort of behind just an editor's email or something like that. And even if it mm -hmm. is, they know a name they can connect with yeah. like a little, on a more personal level. It's a kind of ethos to go back to the terms of uh, Composition 101 yes. sometimes. No. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, well, that all being said, I, I've, I've been so pleased to bring your ethos into this conversation uh, in a lot of ways. Again, like amazing work you're doing with the Cincinnati Review and uh, I, I miss coming by the offices. Um, it's, I'll, I'll have to, I'll have to visit again. I, I don't come home usually until like the, the summer or the winter breaks. Um, but, uh, but sometime I'd love to, love to stop by. Um, yeah. 
So I'm gonna ask you just last question, like what's on the horizon for the journal? You mentioned some stuff coming up a little earlier with the, the play and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what's, uh, what's coming up? Well, it's our 20th anniversary. We're starting to accept yeah. uh, pieces for issue 20.1. And um, as part of that, we're doing some strategic planning, which that survey was a part of. And so we've been for the past year, we've been thinking about where we are, where we might go, getting feedback from a strategic planning board. And I'm at the point where I need to write down some possible action items for the next year, five years, 10 years. Something I know we want to do for sure is thinking about accessibility in our website, which is something that we didn't even begin talking about. Um, but I know we have some issues there. Um, and kind of as we redo the website, keeping that in mind, um, and also producing audio issues. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I have a feeling that, uh, you know, audiobooks have been in, big in fiction for a long time. Mm -hmm. I listened to books on tape when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> but, um, more, I've seen more and more poets starting to put together audiobooks and, you know, um, or just having audio content. And I would love for, um for accessibility reasons but also just for again how we consume content people do it differently to have audio issues available so i'm going to consult with some of our um our lit mag peers about that and um i know those two things are are on the horizon for sure um there are other things that are on the maybe list but those are two big things mm -hmm. And if I could reciprocate for you joining us for this program, please let me know. I'm happy. I love talking about accessibility things. It's uh, oh yeah something that the uh, Kairos Journal has really stressed. Um, and you know, it's mm -hmm. it's become one of those things now where when I'm just putting together media um, for some of the projects I've been working on, like it just eventually just becomes a habit where you're not doing it second as like a sort of like afterthought. It becomes not to say that you're doing that at all, but I mean. I think it's oftentimes just like the thing, oh yeah, we should do this, right? Um, yeah. And I still catch myself doing that, but lately I've kind of moved in this position where I'm like, I just I can plan my media that way before I even start video editing yeah. or something like that. Yeah, um, totally. Yeah, huge thing in, in, terms, in terms of how to handle that and more options are becoming available now to make, um, mm -hmm. make that accessible content with auto transcriptions and things of that sort. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I will definitely reach out to you about that. Please do. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, Lisa, again, so great to have you on the program. Um, and yeah, well, good luck with uh, the 20th anniversary. That's excellent. Thank you. Thank you. It's it's great to see you and talk to you again. And, um, you know, best of, of luck to you. Um, and it sounds like a really great program. So thanks, thanks for including me. Yeah, no problem. All right. Happy holidays. Thanks for joining us on the break. And we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks. Okay, bye. Bye. Okay. So let's just mute that window real quick. Got the little screen grab. Um, I think I just got to turn on my mic now. Um, my source. Let's see. One second. Let's hope that that works. Right now I'm just a disembodied voice. But maybe I'll be back in a minute. Let's see if this works. <laughs> Um, so what we're going to do for just a minute is take a little quick break and then we'll talk about a couple more web platforms here in just a minute. Okay. Bye.
Alrighty, Rue, let's get back to it. And my camera does not want to work today. Let's just see. Let's say, hey, be nice. Come back. Okay, there we go. All right. Hey, everybody. What a nice chat we had with uh, Dr. Lisa Ampleman. Uh, again, big shout out to her and the team of this Insane Review for doing amazing work um, across different genres, poetry, flash fiction, fiction, nonfiction. Yeah, and I, I always appreciate going behind the scenes with editorial teams and just understanding sort of you know uh, what goes on behind the scenes it's it's a it's a lot of work to do to be an editor um and especially as she mentioned just a lot to keep the train running um to make sure it's on time and it's delivering its goods which is great stories things like that okay so a couple things to wrap up with here on today's chat um i'm gonna call your attention to uh before we brought on lisa I was talking a little bit about Brackets, which is a program that you can use to download um, and edit, or to edit, so to say, um, HTML files. My website is built by this program, which is very popular, um, especially you know f for those who want to do kind of hand coding. It's a website called HTML5Up. Um, in fact, this is what I usually assign in my classes. Um, there's the browser, the web address right there. Uh, HTML5up.net. These are Creative Commons HTML5 templates that you can use if you have a code editor like Brackets. And so um, what, the, what I mean by Creative Commons, and I, I can't mention this enough times because I think it's really important, is that Creative Commons templates are, um, or really just media in general, are items you can use as long as you typically give uh, credit where credit is due. So if you were to use this, for example, like one of these websites, you just want to mention at the bottom of it that it's based on um, this template and then point back to who the author was. So I used one and have remixed it considerably um, from this. It's prologue by, actually I need to zoom up here just a little bit so you can see it. Um, is that let me do it? Yep, okay. So you can see this says prologue by AJ at HTML5up, and then I give reference to that as well as the sources I used from Unsplash on my website. So these are all Creative Commons, um, again, meaning you can use them as long as you give credit where credit is due and don't use it for profit. Um, so this, because this is sort of educational, it's just linking back to a lot of the sources. Uh, we're good to go in that way. As I'm not selling it, I'm not doing anything like that. Um, and to give you a little peek about what this looks like, if you've not used Brackets, I'll just show you that real quick here. Brackets, once you download it, it's going to be kind of a new space for you if you've not used it before. But what you can see here is I'm editing my book right now, and I have a number of HTML pages here. For example, my index page, it's letting you know that it's from this template, massively, they call it. And I've, again, remixed this pretty considerably and I've still given credit where credit's due. Um, the nice thing about brackets is you can see all the code, which if you're not familiar with HTML code, like maybe get yourself a little familiar with it or download the template and just start messing with stuff um, before you start to make your own website. Um, and if you wanna preview how things are going to look, you can click on this little lightning bolt here at the top and it gives you um, an HTML preview. So you can see here, like my book, Leaving Digital Media, it is um, all through this. And as I edit areas of it in brackets, um, sometimes it's a little glitchy, but it'll show you where what part of the page you're editing. So let's see if we can, if it actually does what I've promised. Is it, sometimes it'll show you the highlight, but um, you can change this and then refresh this browser and continually edit. So the real distinction between like WordPress is you can just edit on this page, right? And you're not seeing the back end. But I find like as someone who likes to work with web forms, it's really important to have control over that and to sort of see what I'm changing. And just like learning a new program, it becomes eventually like um, second nature 
you know you start writing in code enough you're probably going to get familiar with it however if you're not familiar with it there's a, a a kind of easier way in i want to mention as well let's go ahead and close brackets and this um if you take classes in digital authoring for example in the writing department or you even take dr easter's class on program for professional writers you may be hearing about things like um writing with code and html as well as writing with a program called markdown so markdown as you can sort of see here is like a basically a simplified way of getting text ready for the web so it's even more simplified like markup language which hyper html stands for hypertext markup language this is an even simpler way of getting at it and the website that I've got linked here, which I'll, I'll leave up here on the screen for a minute, is snackedit.io. This is what I give students when sometimes we're getting used to the stakes of writing for the web. So if you go to this, it gives you a helpful guide um, about essentially what the difference is. So this is essentially markup, which it's a number of like hashtags and shorthand characters to make this ready for the web. So this is what it would look like if it were published on the right, that is. Um, and the nice thing about this, it's kind of self-guided in the sense that it shows you like the, a cheat sheet you can see sort of over here. Okay, um, let me see if I can find that. Yep, so the Markdown cheat sheet. So instead of having to go in code and type in something like um, H1, tag closing tag something like that you just get these kind of things so you can do one hashtag for a giant a large header two for a smaller header and three for you know a, a sub subheading something like that emphasis and bold are just a series of um sort of asteries or um hashtags things like that and Again, this was designed so that it's very simple to move things to the web. Um, so if I'm gonna work from this, I might say like, you can see this subfolder here, I could just do, I could, I could completely erase this and then I have this on the right here as a reference. Let's just say we like get rid of the whole thing, right? What it's gonna show me in real time is how this is gonna come together. So I might say like, hey everyone, Thanks for joining today's stream on writing for web platforms. I have I'm like type, I like talking as I go. I have three big takeaways to share with you. Okay, so I've written right on here. I'm starting to do a couple. And now let's just say I want um, three subheads, right? I can go take away one. Take away two. And let's say take away three. And it doesn't follow the formatting as I go. So if I'm just writing here, it's gonna make a normal paragraph. So um, let's say uh, writing for the web. Demands consistency. Consistency. Did I spell that right? Consistency. I don't know if I spelled that right. Uh, there's no small check on here, so <laughs> um, maybe it's an E that I need. That's okay. That's why we need a copy editor on the fly. Um, the, error of the CR publishes blog posts and content. several days a week. Okay. Writing, then we could say writing for the web often draws on visuals and short blocks of writing for quick consumption. I might say something like that. 
And then if we wanted to add something like an emphasis, we could just do like this. We could do two asterisks and say, really? You know, um, take away three. When working with a professional website, I'm just going off the top of my head. If you have ideas, let me know. Your site on a regular basis, e.g. during winter, winter, during winter term. And we could go like, no kidding. So what if we tried this? What would happen if we just do those two? Or no kidding. So if we do one asteris, as it sort of says up here, um, we could do an emphasis, like an uh, underline. And then the nice thing too is you say, read more about the Cincinnati Review. We could do something like this. Um, hyperlinks, it's sometimes timely to do that, but you can actually convert it into a link by using just a little bit um, of a quick bracket. So we could sort of do this. And yep, we can do. So what we would do here is put in the web address as they're sort of saying here. Um, since any review, we would do something like this. So this feels like you're doing a little bit of coding, but it's not as intensive as the many sort of layers and tags that come with HTML coding. And so now I can see if, if I were to use Markdown, this is kind of what my page would look like. Uh, again, with Stack Edit, um, which is one of the ones I've found to be pretty useful for this, uh, you could later do something that's pretty neat. Um, if you go over here on the right, you can go to Exports, and then you can export it as an HTML file, and it'll show you what it looks like as a basic one. So if we call this style, I usually do plain text just because I want to see on the surface what it looks like, and I can check it out that way. So I'll, let's just go put that there, and let's open it up and check it out. So this is what it should look like as a basic HTML um, file. And then you could take this file, as you see here, like um, as an HTML file itself, I could down, I've got this downloaded. I could open it up in brackets and then begin to style it later on. But on the surface, if you're just trying to start an HTML file, definitely look at stack edit, um, just for getting used to some of those moves. And then you can look at like in brackets later, if you want to do some more work, um, you could actually open this file and then see how it was styled or sort of formatted for uh, as a result of being from, um, sorry, looking for this, as a result of being from Stack Edits. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so you see it kind of made like headings one and two and things like that for me. Um, very simple, and then I can add other stuff as I go. And it even gives you an ID tag in case you want to do some stuff like that. And I should also mention um, that designing things to be digestible is something I've struggled with myself, and I had to completely redo when I was working on my website. Um, you know, for my book, for example, like I used to have many, many different um, uh, sort of bits that you could navigate. So every part of my chapters in my book had a new page. So it was like, imagine five parts per chapter, right? Um, all of those were linked in the original file. And that got to be way, way too long um, because you, you, as soon as you think five chapters times five is 25 sections and then even more. So what I decided to do is for readability purposes, I added a chapter navigation here on the right and um, links that show you where you are on the page. So if no matter where you start on here, if you come back, you can actually go um, and find it that way. And so that's kind of a middle ground because I I want to have it all on one page, but I want it to be easily um, searchable and have a good navigation. So we'll see like how that sort of turns out. Um,
thing. And for me, it, it was just a way of making sure that um, I people can approach this in, in kind of compartmentalized ways. Okay. So we are about at the end of time. I want to mention a couple of things before we wrap up uh, for the day. Again, really loved going through these kind of conversations and ideas of writing for the web because it's it's very multifaceted. There's a lot we can we can kind of consider um, when writing for the web. And if you want to check out more of the practical stuff on brackets and other platforms like Adobe Express and other links, check out that. Um, live stream from last year, which which kind of introduces a number of those. There's even links to prior workshops I've given on this sort of stuff. Um, but to hear sort of from a professional editor and writer about sort of web design and approaches for literary journal was, was really invigorating. Okay, so here we go. We've reached near the, we're coming to the end of all of these workshops, right? For the fall term. More coming out for the winter spring winter term, of course, uh, beginning in January. Next week, we're doing an open writing workshop and hangout. Um, so this is a bit more informal, I'd say. If you know anyone who has projects they're working on and they really want to get some feedback um, from me, we can we can do that live, right? I might even do my own writing and work, workshop it if I don't um, hear from any folks. but. Think of it as a way to just come together and kind of try to decompress a little bit before the end of the term. Got a lot of stuff coming up um, with final projects and things like that. They'll be here before we know it. I just assigned my last one for for both of my classes. And so, you know, our terms in the Canadian system end a little faster than I'm used to, as I'll always say. It's 12 weeks versus 16 weeks. Um, and so, yeah, if you're looking for some feedback, um, some interpretation, let's say, of one of your assignments or you've got something in progress that's digital, we can talk about it. You can even come on the stream if you want, or we could just talk textually um, in the chat about it. Assuming we don't get spammed by bots as has happened a few times. So again, keep in touch and I'll look forward to talking to you all next week. And then we'll take a, a, a break for a bit um, after the term's over and then be back in the winter for much more exciting programming and special guests. Until then, good luck with what you're working on this week, all your writing projects and updates to your websites and so forth. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.